Okay, everybody. Let's get started, shall we? We're going to be talking about the flesh and spirit. Hopefully you guys are ready for this. Now, you guys have to forgive me. I have uh, loaded uh, screens, and I cannot see you. This study, but um, it just simply means it'll go a lot smoother. Maybe. I'll pull you up halfway, likely. Uh, hopefully this gets uh, uploaded in time. I can pull you guys in. Flesh and spirit. This is a uh, one of those studies, a foundational study actually matter if a person understands it which uh, I think that you guys will I think that the uh, simplification of this topic the importance of this topic is a cornerstone subject as far as faith is concerned it'll make a real difference right especially to get rid of those uh, uh, stagnation in your life It'll certainly help you get rid of that. But most importantly, right, it's going to give people a new perspective, um, motivation behind their belief, Christianity. Because sometimes, sometimes, feeding into the paradigm of conversation and lots of hearing, sometimes it seems like, you know, people are, They've reached a plateau to a degree, right? A plateau. And we don't want to reach that plateau, right? We don't want to do that. Excuse me. My throat here. I think I have uh, debris in my throat. You get straight. Let me pull up one window. Mixler. I'm going to pull you guys up real quick. You're the fastest. So let me pull you guys up real quick so I can see if you guys have good sound or not. Just to verify that. It'll be good for, um, it'll be a good thing. All right, stand by. Okay, I can see you guys now. Do you guys have a uh, good sound? Good sound out there? Okay, 5-5 five, five on Mixler. All right, stand by. Everybody, stand by. I, I tell you what, let me give it two more minutes. It says it's in the yellow, which means it's not balanced yet. So give me two more minutes. The sound should be balanced. And then we'll proceed, okay? Two more minutes. I'll be right back. And if you guys want to, I'm going to start in Galatians. Oh, I'm sorry. Nope, I'm not going to start in Galatians. I'm not going to do that. This, this, by the way, this subject, you may not think is controversial at the moment, but you may, right? You may. You may think it's controversial. Also, we're going to start at 2 Corinthians 5. Would you guys turn there? 2 Corinthians 5. You guys there yet? 2 Corinthians 5. We're going to start there. This read opens up quite a bit. So if you guys give me some latitude as far as the conversation that will be had at, at um, when we read this. Try to hear the whole thing. Try to hear the whole thing, right? Try your best to hear the whole thing, all right? St. Corinthians 5.1, For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God and a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. Pause. Let's take a pause. We have to handle this. And, and, and this, by the way, is precept of the conversation. It's all part of the precept. Uh, this is, it begins by talking about this earthly tabernacle being dissolved done away with, your body being done away with, right? That we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, right? We have a building of God, a house not made with hands. So if it's not made with hands, we're not talking about uh, 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 something constructed 
out of wood or stone or metal. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about a vessel, a body, a prepared body for you, which is a temple. It's named a temple because it houses something holy, the Holy Spirit, right? And the Lord, right, which are uh, one and the same. That's why Jesus said, I and the Father are one. The Holy Spirit being the spirit of the living God, right? Poured out on all flesh, correct? That's in Acts chapter 2. So, your vessel can house the Holy Spirit, can house Christ, can house holy things. It can. It has that potential. That potential. Okay. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. How many desire to be clothed with their house, which is from heaven. How many? Do you really? How many of you grown, you have an earnest desire, an honest desire to have a heavenly body? How many have that desire? Because if you have that desire, right, then you have comprehension of self. You have comprehension of self. Consequently, to have something according to the flesh is according to self, according to your natural understanding. Boy, we're going to get somewhere tonight. So most agree that they have an earnest expectation, right? Or, or they would like to have a glorified body or a heavenly body, a house which is from heaven, your body which is from heaven. In order to have that desire, that sincere desire, right? You're going to have to look at something. Some have a desire from self or natural desire from your own personal perspective, right? Which means you may uh, perceive flaws in your own body. It may be too sick or you perceive the struggle. All that's natural. But if that's why you have a desire, that desire may not be founded from the right perspective. We're going to get to that. I'm just softening the blow here, right? It's just like um, to, we know ourselves according to the flesh first. We know other people according to the flesh first, which is a natural part of man, okay? Self, self according to flesh is according to self from your perspective. Many people have a relationship with the Lord according to self, according to what you see, what you perceive, what you understand, what you experience. Now, just so I don't, you know, so nobody bangs their head, to have a relationship with Christ according to self has already been named. We're going to study that. But that's not exactly what the Lord was giving to us, right? In other words, we have lots of experiences. But an experience is not a guide for truth. You can have a moment. You can have a moving experience. It does not make that experience truth. It does not make that experience holy. There are cults out there and movements, and they have these life-altering experiences. It doesn't make that experience truth. It does not. You have people out there that believe in things and are moved with a deep, deep, deep moving, right? But it's all, but it could be from self, and it does not make it truth, right? We have a relationship with Christ, and that relation, that relationship with Christ, is according to first our natural man. So that's according to self. Well, guess what? Guess what? That relationship you have of self with Christ may not be what you've been after. Oh, boy, we're going to get somewhere. We're going to get some. In other words, you have the ingredients, but you may not have turned. You, you probably mixed up the ingredients. But your stove may not be on. 
See, because listen, you can't tell me to have a relationship with Christ Jesus, the only begotten Son of the living God. You can't tell me you can have that relationship and your life be the same. You can't tell me that you can toggle back and forth, right? Knowing the spirit of the Son of the living God, the, the absolute Word of God, and your life be just like everybody else's. Nope, you can't tell me that. You cannot. You can have a natural relationship. You can have a relationship after your own perspective. You can have a relationship based upon what you've been through, your experiences, what you have read, the conclusions you have come to. You can have that relationship. And you will toggle back and forth. And sometimes you will lose your placement. You cannot tell me you have a relationship with Jesus Christ after the spirit and ever go back to normal. You can't tell me that you have come into a relationship and communion with the son of the living God, the absolute word of God. And somehow you don't have the power to overcome anything in the earth. Nope. You can't tell me that. See, that deserves an explanation. It should also get you excited because you might want to say to yourself, oh, oh, see, I can get there. I didn't get there yet. I thought I was there because that was my conclusion. How many of you had a conclusion and you said, okay, I did everything required? Oh, that's according to self. That's according to yourself. That's according to your natural faculties. That's according to your observations, what you know, what you have experienced. That's according to the truth you have collected to yourselves. We're not after that. We're after what's according to the living God. Not according to self, but according to the living God. Right? It's like the absolute question. Who is the real you? Is the real you what people perceive and in and, and, and the lifelong dedication you have had to the Lord that they observe by way of the eye? Is that who you are? Is who you are, who you know, by your relationship and what you have learned in the sum, right? The sum total of your experiences. Is that who you are in Christ? No, it is not. Who you are in Christ is who you are in relationship with Christ. That supersedes everything you've ever experienced on earth. Experience. Experience. Your experience is not a guide to truth. That door of truth has been opened up, and it is not by your experience. If we're going to get somewhere with this. You know what's missing in this world? An empowerment. You're not going to tell me that people who have a solid relationship with Christ somehow have lost their flame. Well... Or my calling must be to ignite that flame again, to keep that flame going, to squeeze every ounce of oil that can be squeezed. Did you notice in that parable of the virgins, God did not light their lamps. He did not. He left that up to humanity. Did you notice that? God didn't come down and light their lamps. He told them to light their lamps. Back to Corinthians. For in this we groan, what do we groan for? What do we honestly want? That we have a building in God, a house not made with hands from the eternal heavens. We earnestly desire to be clothed upon with a house which is from heaven. If so be that the being clothed, we shall not be found naked. If so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. To be found naked, to be found open, to be found not covered, right? If you don't have, if you're not clothed in something, then what are you? You're nothing. You're, not, you're unidentifiable. That's what you are. That's what you are. You don't have an identity. Whose robes do you have on? Whose garments do you have on? Right? That's part of your identity, almost like a uniform, but it identifies you. Right? Let's continue. Plus, 
it grants to you your identity. Now, it's much more than like a shirt or a uniform. Let me take that back. It's, let me take that back. It is much more than a uniform, right? To be clothed is to be covered. To be covered is to be able to exist. To be contained, to exist, to be someone. If you have no garments, you're no one. You have no identity. You're floating to and fro around and can be clothed with anybody's garments. When you already have garments on, you already have an identity. And it's founded within the one you got the garments from. So if you have heavenly garments, your identity is bound in the heavens. Right now, you're clothed with coats of skin. Do you know that? You're clothed with coats of skin. So everybody says you're a human being. That coat of skin is of a specific type of flesh. In the Bible, there are different types of flesh. Different types. So animals are clothed in a few types of uh, flesh, right? Fish are clothed in another type of flesh. You're clothed, and we say we're human beings because we have coats of skin. And what does that do? That makes us individuals. That gives us a portion of an identity. What are we after here, though? What are we after here in this reading? Desiring to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. Thank God give us an, a direct identity. Not born of this earth. Not from this earth, but from the eternal realm, from a perfect place. Not something we inherited from the earth, but from the living God. Our eternal identity. My, my, see how different that is? Let me continue. For we that are in his tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for what we would be unclothed, not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon, that mortality might be swallowed up of life. One more time, because you guys didn't go, oh. here it is, St. Corinthians 5, 4. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan. Those people that are in the flesh, that are alive, that are human beings, we do groan. Being burdened. You're being burdened. Now, listen, this does not apply to those who are outside of the relationship with Christ. If you don't have a relationship with Christ, this does not apply to you. You won't be able to make sense of this. Why would a person, why in the world would a person that's in this earth groan? Now, what, what are you groaning for? Something else, not just anything else, but specifically your eternal body of the Son of the living God and the Father. Not to be E.T.'s son, not to be some new creature, not to be reincarnated, right? Not, not, not any of those things. Not, not to be a different person either. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed, right? Not to be stripped or to be stripped of this human flesh. No, not that. Not to become something that's not human, has nothing to do with that. But clothe the bond. That mortality might be swallowed up of life. That means to have your identity intact, you have to look at that language. He's saying, for we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed, not to have some brand new, spanking brand new identity. Not to be disconnected. From what you are right now, you see, you have to have a relationship. See, do you see what this is saying, St. Corinthians 5, 4? They're not groaning to be some sort of non-human. See, oh, 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 here we go. They're not groaning to be a non-human. No, they're groaning to be clothed with heavenly garments. That means who you are is intact. Now, how can this be? How can this be? How can that be? How can that be? Let me tell you what most people want, and it's not this. Most people want absolute disassociation with who they are. 
They want to become somebody nobody else knows, a brand new person, a brand new start. That's what they're after. That's not what we're talking about. Uh-oh. Now we're getting somewhere because they're not groaning to become some new individual. That's not who they're groaning to be. They're not groaning. Paul is not groaning to become, you know, some other guy. That's not what he's groaning about. He's groaning to be clothed upon from garments from heaven. So that mortality, so that th this short lifespan, right, these things you're not able to accomplish will be taken away. Oh, see, now we're getting somewhere. You, you see how sometimes people's minds have been in escape. i got to escape. i got to get away. I have to get away. I'm going to become something else, and nobody's going to know who I am. Wrong. Don't groan for that. That's running away. Nowhere in the Word of God do you ever learn a principle of running away. You never learn a principle of running away. God made you who you are. Listen to me, folks. God made you who you are. Our problem is we've been listening to the world who teaches us to become something else. That is not what God teaches. God is thorough from the beginning. He made no mistakes. He did make not one mistake. You are not a mistake. You've been listening and guided by a voice of the world who would tell you to abandon who God made you to be and to become somebody else in the world. Get rid of that mindset that's nowhere close to sobriety. Do you all see, right now, do you see how many have been trained to have an ideology to get ready to throw away everything God established in them. Do you see that? Do you see it? Do you see what's happening in the world? How people are moving away from who God made them to be. Listen, you ready for this? That's why homosexuality comes with, it's just outside of God's will. Why? Because you're becoming something God did not create you to be. God didn't make a mistake. He did not. The world is seeking to redefine people, to have them put on strange garments. God knew what he was doing. He made no mistake. You were fearfully and wonderfully made who you were in the beginning. It is the world, the world who motivated you to change yourself. God did motivate you to do that. You were always accepted for who you were. Always. But your interpreter, which was the world, lied to you. God knows exactly what he's doing. Let me continue. So let me read 2 Corinthians 5, 4 one more time. One more time. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon, that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Now he that hath wrought us, wrought us from the selfsame thing is God, who also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit, the truth of the Spirit. Now, he that hath wrought us, he that made us, he that developed us, he that designed us, for the selfsame thing is God, who also hath given us the earnest of the Spirit, the, the truth of the Spirit. Therefore, we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. That's in parentheses. Because it's giving you an explanation of what he's talking about. Because he just said, therefore, we are always confident. Knowing that while we are at home in the body, while it's normal for us to be in the body, that's what at home means, normal, right? Something that is natural to you, right? While it's natural to be in the body, we are absent from the Lord. 
We're absent from the Lord. We know this, right? Because we walk by faith or live by faith. We're not living by nor walking by or being guided by what we see. But the truth of the word of God. That's what walking by faith is. Second Corinthians 5, 8, we are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. We're willing to give all that up, though this body is all we know. To be in this body is all we know. It is home. We are used to it. We are willing to give all this up to be present with the Lord. Do you see that? This requires relationship. Second Corinthians chapter 5 requires a relationship with Christ. To understand, if you don't have a relationship, this is not going to make sense to you. It will not. And, and if you don't have a relationship with Christ, just tell someone. Tell someone in COT. Just tell someone in COT. Because that door is open directly to you. That's what all this labor is about. So that you get to know who the great physician is. So you can come into the fold for real. You don't have to sit on the outskirts hoping and wishing you'd be a part of something. You have an opportunity to be a part of something. You do. Not to save your skin from the calamities of earth. No. No. But to accept the one who gave his life for you, who can take away every wrong in your life. Everything you ever did wrong that you struggle with now, all can be forgiven. And you can be put back in your rightful position as a sinless creation of God and that's only the first step that's what this is for all that happens by the blood of the lamb the final sacrifice that was given for all mankind through Christ Jesus that's why his name is so important that's why it's a name above every name because he's the only one who gave us life who paid the price for all of our infractions whether it be accidental or purposed, it doesn't matter. He gave his life so that we could be free of the penalty of sin. And that door is wide open right now. So if you don't know him, that's what this is all about. Never be ashamed to say, I need that. Never be ashamed. That's what all this is for. Let me continue. St. Corinthians 5.8 we are competent, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Wherefore, we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. We labor to be accepted of him. Now, I know this is a one of those passive statements. We labor to be accepted of him because there, there's a problem. But let me finish this, and I'll talk about the problem. Second Corinthians 5.10 for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. What does that mean? What is that? Let's put this in perspective. Thank you, Lord. Second Corinthians 5.10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one may receive the things done in his body according to that he had done, whether it be good or bad, that you may receive that, that, listen, this is why no one escapes anything. And no good deed goes without someone knowing. We're going to stand before the Lord. And according to what we have done, so shall we receive. Now follow me on this before you say a word. Follow me on this. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, because when you stand before him, listen, you're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ, period. You're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ, period. Period. You're going to be before him based on what you have done in this body or otherwise, whether that be good or bad. Right? Everyone is going to have to deal with that repayment of it. You're going to stand there in front of Christ to receive what you have sown in the body, whether that be good or bad. Now, now stay with me. But try not to say a word. Stay with me. 
Stay with me. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, because this is terrible, isn't it? We persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, not trust also are made manifest in your consciences. For we commend not ourselves again unto you, but give you occasion to glory on our behalf, that you may have somewhat to answer them with glory in appearance and not in heart. Let me read that again. For we commend not ourselves again unto you, but give you occasion to glory on our behalf, that ye may have somewhat to answer them which glory in appearance and not in heart. For whether we be beside ourselves, it is to God, or whether we be ourselves beside ourselves, it is to God, or whether we be sober, it is for your cause. For the, for the love of Christ constraineth us. This is very important, 2 Corinthians 5.14. For the love of God constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all. Now, now listen to the context of this word judge. Because we thus judge or come to a conclusion that if one died for all, then we are all dead. And that he died for all that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Wherefore, henceforth, know we no man after the flesh. Pause. He says, from here on out, we don't know anybody after the flesh. So, I mean, let me tell you something. St. Corinthians 5.10 is heavy. And I know that just shocked some of you folks. Right? You know the scripture that says, pray that you're worthy to escape all these things and to stand before the Son of Man? Really? Are you ready for that? Are you that confident? Anybody in here, are you that confident? I'll tell you right now, I'm not that confident. To stand in the judgment, to stand before God and the Lord in the right there in front of the judgment seat of Christ? I'm not that confident. I am not that confident. That's why I said, pray that you're worthy to escape all these things. But see, if you escape everything, you've got to be ready to stand before the Son of Man. That means you have your whole life worked out. That's what it means. Anybody here willing to take that chance to be a castaway and never get a do-over? I am not. Because there's no pride in me. There's no ego and I am not so confident to sit there and say, oh, yep, I've met all the requirements and I'm doing everything right. You can forget that, buddy, because I know I do not know everything. I do not know everything. For we, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. You, you mean to tell me? People are ready for that. You, do you see how sometimes we can lock on to things so far outside of sobriety? Hmm? Hmm? And I says, not one of you have caught it yet. Not one of you have caught this, caught something yet. Is that possible to stand before the Son of Man? Not one of you have caught that yet. I'm going to give you one more chance. See, because I'll tell you something. If you're scared and you want to go to be with the Lord, you're not ready to stand before him. Only those who have a commitment deep down in their hearts who are willing to go all the way. Those are the ones who are candidates that are ready to stand before him. No one who is scared is ready to stand before him. No one. Because to stand before him is to give an account. It's for that person who stands before him. That person will receive the things done in the body, whether it be good or bad. They're going to reap. They're going to reap. So to stand before the Son of Man, you want to stand before him sinless. Sinless. The act of repentance when you ask for forgiveness, is a real thing. Which means if you ask for forgiveness, but you go back out and sin again, you did not repent in the first place. Because to repent 
literally means to turn away from. The CRT definition is turn away from and never do again. When you repent, you're done with something. You're not doing it again, but it is God who gives us knowledge of what to repent for, which is why you have to pray. How many of you have noticed throughout your life, not all at one time, but throughout your life, the Lord will make you aware of areas in your life that are full of sin, and over time, You'll say, thank you, Lord. I would have never known that unless you brought that to my attention. And then you repent. You don't repent of everything at one time. You do not. God makes you aware of what you're doing over the course of time. He didn't overwhelm you with everything all at one time. Now, if we're honest and truthful with ourselves, we know that God has shown us over time areas we require repenting in. We know that. So what does that tell you? God knows your exact timing. Stop being so frightened. God is working a work through Christ in you that is powerful and thorough. And it will end in absolute victory. Stop being bullied to want to escape the earth so bad because you believe the stories of everybody else. Stop doing that. That is moving by somebody else's word. You are to only move by the Lord's word. Not by my words. Not by anybody else's words. But the Lord's words. Right? Don't let me talk. You get scared and say, well, I want to leave tonight. Stop doing that. Stop doing that. That's how the blind lead the blind. You guys know what the blind leading the blind is? That's when flesh leads flesh. Both fall into a ditch. That's what that's about. It's about flesh leading flesh. So me in my natural state, with an impure mouth, speaking. And if you act upon those things I'm speaking about, you're going to fall into the same ditch I just fell into. Because you became fearful of a construct that was spoken by flesh. You're not to be moved, but by the words spoken by the living God, not by men. And see, listen to me. That's why the world has taught you obedience through education, through your jobs, with continual threats. But if you don't if you're not pleasing on the job, you can get fired. They teach you to live under the whip of fear. Don't you know this? Look at employment. If you don't do your best job, you're working under conditions that if you don't do your best, you're going to be fired. Somebody tell me I'm not telling the truth here. Somebody tell me that. This is what the world has trained you to do. And as a consequence of that, when you start reading the Bible, you start becoming fearful of things, and you say, wow, I need to do right because I'm scared of the consequences. That's not why you do right. See, that's still working to save your own butt. That's what that's doing. No one will step foot in the kingdom who only sought to save their own butt. That should not be your motivation. But recognition of the Messiah is key. And a relationship with him is key. Do you see that? God didn't give us a spirit of fear. That's why he talked about it. That's why it was mentioned so many times. Because the spirit of fear can have you walking and doing things that are contrary to all holiness. It's time to change that. 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 Are you family or not? Family is not family because they're frightened not to be family. Family is family because they love their family and the members in that family. Now you get a bunch of strangers together under a hammer of cruelty. And people will be family out of fear. 
God's family is not family out of fear. God's family is family bound in love. It's bound in love. Nothing is outside of love. So it's not fear. It's not because you're afraid, because you're frightened of what you might endure if you're not family. Don't you know, the Bible even tells us as how we came to Christ, because everything fell apart. And for a lot of us, he was our last chance. And those of you in whom he was your last chance, he turned out to be your first choice. Hmm? My goodness. Stay with me now, everybody. Stay with me. Hmm? Stay with me. Somebody says, what does it mean to work out your uh, relationship with fear and trembling? Fear is respect. Don't forget that word fear and trembling. Fear is respect. To work out your own salvation, right, means you cannot be saved according to the changes in my life. You have to search deep the Lord in your life. You cannot listen to me and expect all salvation. You must have your relationship. When you work out your own salvation, what are you doing? You're solidifying your relationship with Christ. That's what you're doing. You're not putting the relationship down. No, no. See, because if you're serious about being a family member, you're going to study hard about that family because you want to be pleasing to the patriarch of that family. Correct? And if you want to be a family, if, if you spotted a family in the earth that moved you so much that you wanted to be family, listen to me, you would have to already know about that family, wouldn't you? You would have to already know. You would have to have already investigated that family. You would also have to know other families. You just don't pick out and say, oh, I want to be that family. Why? I have no idea. I just want to be that. No, that's not the way it works. So when someone wants to be saved, do you not know that God has a process? He does. That person who desires to be saved, it may have taken 20, 30, 40 years, but they've been in the Bible. That person has heard someone preach. That person has been drawn to God on and off throughout their lives. And then they start to see the world in a very real way. In fact, right before you're saved, you start seeing the world for what it is. You do? And you say, oh, my Lord, that I don't want, what have I become? That's one of the statements that you say is, what have I become? This is not me. I don't want this. I don't want this. That's what happens when God opens your eyes. One of the first things you said was, I don't want this. It's one of the first things. And then the Lord gives you a moment of understanding, enough to make, and a truthful choice. He shows you what you have been. He conveys to you who he is. And if you truly belong to that family already, you begin to identify. When you identify, that's when you accept. That's when you voice your truth, your desire to be a part of that family. When you're working out your own salvation, it must be you making that choice. It must be just you making that choice. Just you working out your salvation and seeking, seeking all elements of that relationship, yourself. It must be authentic. It must be you. Do you all see that? See, when if, if everybody who knew the Lord in my life died, right? Or let's put it this way. If everybody I looked up to in the Lord if they all of a sudden were in a backslidden condition, it would not phase me. 
It will not interrupt my relationship, not one millisecond. It won't. Because my relationship is with Christ, based in my authentic self, not based off flesh, based off a true desire of the depths of who I am. It has nothing to do with anybody else. So that if anybody else falls, I won't even have a hiccup. My relationship with Christ is not connected to anybody else but Christ. So you work out your own salvation. See, but unfortunately, there are people in this world today that if their leader fell, they would fall too. They would lose hope. The key is to emphasize the relationship with Christ so that that person has an intimate relationship. So no matter who falls, they do not. And if a person loves you, guess what? They're going to arm you with everything they can. Always, they're always going to do that but they'll always point you towards Christ. They will never point you towards themselves. When somebody loves you, they're going to point you towards what's going to free you. They will never point you towards themselves. A cult points to itself. A family points to the solution. And Lord knows we don't need any other cults, do we? We don't need that. But I'm not telling you guys anything new. Must continue. Must continue. After all this, it says, it says this. First Corinthians 5.14, For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. If one died for all, then we're all dead. What does that mean? Christ constraineth us. To constrain something, right, is to put a limitation on something, to hold it within a certain boundary, right? So for the love of Christ constraineth us. For the love of Christ constraineth us. Well, only let us go so far because we thus judge, we come to the conclusion that if one died for all, then we're all dead. If Jesus in the flesh died, he did not die in the spirit, he died in the flesh. If he died in the flesh for all, then all are dead to the flesh. When you're in him, you're dead to the flesh. What does that mean? That means your flesh does not have rule over you. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves. Remember something. Flesh is what? What is flesh? Flesh is what? A, the natural part of man, yes. But flesh, according to flesh, equals according to self. It's according to you, to what you think, to what you see, to what you have concluded. Right? We're not after that. We're not after anything concerning flesh, but of the spirit, which is God, right? We don't want the word according to self, according to flesh. We want the word according to who? The living God. Wherefore, henceforth, we know no man after flesh, yea, though we have known Christ after flesh, Yet now henceforth we know him no more. Oh, you see that? 2 Corinthians 5, 16. Because if you just disputed what I said earlier, here it is. It says, wherefore henceforth know we no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, it says we knew Christ after the flesh. It says, yet now henceforth know we him no more. We don't know him after the flesh anymore. We don't know him 
after the flesh anymore. We don't know him according to ourselves anymore. We don't know him. Listen, when you know something according to yourself, you know it based off what you see. You know it based off what you have experienced. You know it based off what you perceive. That is of self. That is of flesh. Right? And they're saying we knew him like this before. We knew him like this before, but we don't know him anymore like this. We don't know him like this anymore. We don't know him according to what we see, to all the deeds and the miracles that he did. We don't know him just according to his speech, as we have perceived in our hearing. We don't know him because of that anymore. Do you see that? Do you guys see that? That always messes people up right there. That one messes people up big time. Let me read it one more time, 2 Corinthians 5, 16. Wherefore, henceforth, know we no man after the flesh. Now, also take into account to know someone after their natural, you know, self or according to yourself or their natural deeds and things of this nature. To know someone like that is also to either embrace or push away like that, right? Which means you, you, you have your acquaintance known like that after what a person has done or after what they did not do. All that's a flesh. All of that is a flesh. If you, and let's go ahead and face it. Let's go ahead and face it. Because a lot of people have not gotten to this step yet. A lot of people do not know each other after the spirit. They only know each other according to the flesh or after that natural aspect of themselves. They only know it according to themselves. They don't know a person according to the Spirit. What's being emphasized here in 2 Corinthians 5.16 is this, Wherefore, henceforth, we know no man after the flesh. That's a statement, everybody, which means they're not going to embrace or push away based upon a person's deeds, based upon their record, history, family, or any other attribute that people can perceive or equate of an individual. Right? So there's no evaluation. Zero. Thank you, Lord. There's no evaluation. There's no evaluation. See, some people are getting it. You're getting it. There's no evaluation of that person based on what they have done, based on what they just said, based on what they did. There's no evaluation of that person. You don't know a person like that anymore. Thank you, Lord. Somebody's getting this. And it says, we, we, uh, wherefore, henceforth, we know no man after the flesh. That's a statement. Then it confirms something, yes, though we knew Christ after the flesh, yet now, henceforth, we know him no more. That means we don't know him anymore after the flesh. That's another declarative statement. Listen, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Now you see why. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Well, you know, to be a new creature means your flesh is truly mortified. You know what that means? That means who you are is not based on where you have been or what you have done. Thank you, Lord. It's not based on the sum total of your experience here on earth. Thank you, Lord. That's not what it's based on. That is not who you are is not based on. What you've done. See, listen, side note, that's what the Essenes wanted people to believe. That's what the Gnostic Gospels sometimes emphasize. Works, 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 works. Boy, oh, that was just nullified. Don't worry, I'll cover that later. Let me read that one more time, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. All things are become, you're not known anymore by anything connected to your flesh. That's possible through Christ only. That's why. That's why. Listen, that's why your relationship with Christ, according to flesh, has to change. And it can't.
can change. You're not stuck. You are by no means stuck. No means. The death of Christ. It killed the body. Do you know what that means? It did not kill Christ. He killed the body. Do you know what that means? Do you guys know what that means? That means the power of your flesh has been destroyed. According to you, listen now, what that means is the power of your flesh is now dead with Christ. This is very important. It is not dead without Christ. It is dead with Christ, and there is a missing element in your life. God's power is true. Any addiction can be broken. I'm telling you now, the problem is it takes these precepts to get a person to understand the dynamics of salvation itself so they can finally accept the truth given by Christ Jesus and not by the world. That means an authentic, that means authentically receiving Christ Jesus. There's power in that, but people have no power because they're doing everything according to the world, according to some philosophy. And, it, and you all are witnesses. You're witnesses. It is powerless. It is powerless. The world's way is powerless, spiritually powerless. God's way of being simple is full of power. And there is an absolute victory in it. A daily victory, do you hear me? Did Christ stand in the earth in the Old Testament? No, he did not. Nor did the prophets enjoy the company of the Christ. That was reserved for you. Even the apostles who saw him knew about you, those who would not see him. And I tell you now, your faith is more than theirs. They believed because they saw. You're the ones who believe and you have not seen. If they had enough faith to move their mountain, you're the ones that have not seen. And nothing can compare to the faith you operate by. So stop allowing Satan to tell you that your faith is weak. You cannot have weak faith and believe that the Messiah is. I'm going to take a break and let you guys swallow this. We're coming back to this. Man, this conversation is about the flesh and the spirit. Are you all starting to see? Some, now, no, it's a bit fuzzy. Still, we have some more to cover. We have some more to cover. We have a lot to cover. I know it's a bit fuzzy. Hang in there. Because this should have broken down the paradigm that the world gives where people have zero power. Let me, let me tell you a mystery. You have all power. But you've been convinced never to exercise it, never to walk in it. Let me say one statement that you'll understand. You've been walking in a contradiction, but you couldn't figure out the contradiction. A walking disturbance. Mm -hmm. We'll clear that up when I get back. We'll clear it up. It's almost like smelling something, but you can't quite get the taste of it. Mm -hmm. Can't quite get the taste. So you know you're close, but you can't quite get it. God's power is not limited. His miracles are real. His supernatural ways. Those are reserved for you. Many have not grabbed hold of them. 
because you don't grab hold of them. Nor do you walk after the manner of the teachings of this world, trying to walk a holy path based off the teachings of the world, based off popular teachings from hirelings. No, but from the simplicity of the word of God and your absolute acceptance of who Jesus is. You have to start there. You start there. Your true acceptance of the Messiah. Listen, when one truly accepts the Messiah, simply accepting him is everything. You know you have truly accepted the Messiah when you seek nothing else. Thank you, Lord. When you seek nothing else, you have found him. If you're still seeking, you have not found. Because those who find what they're looking for are no longer searching, are they? But if you have not found what you're looking for, you're going to be searching for something you don't know what it is. I'm telling you what I know. I'll be back in a few minutes right here at the Council of Time. I am back. All right, back to our study here, guys. I want to ask you guys something before we start back into this. We have read what we read. You guys have any questions? I'm sure you do. But let me say this first. Do you trust the Lord's work? I personally trust the Lord's work. I trust this work. And because I trust this work, you know how in our minds pass down from generation to generation, an ideology has permeated the body. Try and hear me without offense, everybody. This is an ideology that has permeated or infiltrated the body of Christ. And it makes a person not trust his work. See, because when you trust his work, you appreciate the fact that he knows what he's doing. He's raising each and every one of you. He is directly. So your life is going in his direction. What has happened is someone has taught us that somehow we can maneuver God into having him release his secrets so that we can have our way. That is a darkness. That is a deep darkness. I've known people who live their lifetimes trying to get God to do something, trying to find the perfect formula. And in so doing, they did not trust the living God and how he was raising them. He's raising us all. I have all confidence in his raising of me so that when a condition is in my life, I know that condition is working something or would not be in my life at all. The big lie is, is that something would needlessly happen to you. That is a lie. How can we have a Messiah and something useless be in our lives? We are being saved. We are being saved. People have made the mistake believing that somehow in the confidence of their own doings that they are completely saved. That is not what the word teaches. That's why he says, lift up your heads. Look up and lift up your heads for your redemption draweth nigh. He will finish the work he began in you. He is the author and finisher of your faith. There is no formula. There is God raising us according to how we need to be raised. When I was young, 
we used to stand together in groups and people would look at others, each other's scars and go, ooh, I haven't been touched. You know, I'm perfect, I'm this, an older guy would come up and he was bald and people would look at him, oh, you're bald. As you get older, when you become bald, when you become scarred, you can't hang around the young groups anymore. Then all of a sudden, the Lord opens your eyes. And at first, you're mad because of the scars and the baldness. And you're saying, Lord, look, I can't even stand among those who are put together well. I'm over here by myself. Then God opens your eyes. And do you know what you do? You look at them. They're bound up, captured, totally duped into the world of vanity, of ego and pride. And then you lift up your hands and say, thank you, Lord, for freeing me. I'm free. I didn't know how to get out myself because I didn't know I was in bondage. But now I know. When God opens your eyes, that's when you find out he freed you from bondage. That's when you realize you didn't know you were in bondage. You didn't know how to get out. Mm -hmm. Somebody says, Mike, we know the scriptures, but why is work so slow? If we knew the scriptures, if we actually knew the scriptures, the work would not be slow. The work would only be thorough. We wouldn't know slow or fast because we would have patience to actually know scripture. To have scripture is to have the number one attribute, the number one property that goes with all who have eternal life who are promised eternal life, and who know they're promised eternal life, is in your patience possess ye your souls. That's a virtue you cannot do without. See, when we find ourselves rushing God, we have come to a conclusion before he has. When we try to rush our father, we think we know better than him. Everything he does, if he did not do it, we would surely die. If he did not work what he's working in your individual lives, you would die. Listen, he is saving you. Every day you wake up and have breath, he is saving you. It's all part of the process of salvation. Why does it take so long? Because we are stubborn. We're not willing half the time. And he's very patient. He'll do a perfect work in all of us. Didn't he promise that? I'll tell you right now, it's impossible for anybody to do a perfect work in me. But the Lord is doing it. Somehow, he's doing it. But we, we have to finally realize that the Lord is raising us. We are not going to dictate his movements. And what he does... He does because it's necessary or he, he would not do it. God does not do a needless thing. Christ does not do a needless thing. He does nothing in vain. So all things are purposed. All things. This is when you dig deep and you deny all things of your own flesh and you trust him as best you can. And you put your mind in his hand. Again, we didn't do it, but there's an ideology that has infiltrated the body of Christ here on this earth. And it has taught people that somehow they know better than God. See, if I had a commander, and I was talking to another guy, and I said, I don't know why this guy is just, what is he doing, filling his thumbs? The only reason I would say that it's because I can't perceive what he's doing. When you cannot perceive what the Lord is doing, it's always going to look like 
be, you know, too much time is being taken, right? Only when you see someone working on your behalf do you have any confidence and say, okay, they're working on something, I'm good to go, right? Because when we see somebody work, it's just like a broken car. If you have a broken vehicle or a broken house or something is broken and you took it to a shop and you don't see anybody working on your car, you're going to cross your arms and say, what is going on here? What are you guys doing? All of a sudden, they're not doing anything. They don't know what they're doing, right? Because you don't perceive them doing anything until you realize you were looking at the wrong car. And your car was in about 50 pieces. Once you see your car in pieces and people working on the car, you're instantly fine. Nothing changed but your perception. Do you see that? What gives you confidence is your perception, not the situation, not the change in the situation, but what you perceive gives you confidence. When you see somebody working on your stuff, you instantly say, and confirm and affirm within yourselves, okay, they're working on it. They're good. They're, you get happy. But if you see no one working on it, you cross your arms, you're upset, you're mad because you can't perceive any work is being done. See that? Listen, the Lord is always working in our lives, always. There is not a moment of idleness with the Lord in our lives, not one moment. So here's a challenge. Instead of looking at something like it was not supposed to happen, never do that again. Look at all things, consider all things, and you'll see the hand of the living God working in your life every day of your life. Every day of your life. That's when your heart of thanks is multiplied. When we stop assuming that something was not supposed to happen. We've got to get out of the world of assumption. Into the realm of truth. Assumption is not truth. Knowledge is not truth. Experience is not truth. God's word is truth. His decrees are truth. He is truth. And you can find that every day of your life when you stop assuming he's doing nothing because he's doing everything. Everything. Remember that. 2 Corinthians 5.19 Oh, 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 2 Corinthians 5, 18. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself. Let me read that one more time. To wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, not charging them with what they did, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then we are ambassadors of Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead. Be ye reconciled to God. Instead of just knowing, instead of just knowing, right? Just knowing that God has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, instead of just knowing it, let's become it. To become something like that is to receive it. It's to stop thinking it on everybody else's life and denying it upon your own life. That's no good either. You can't sit there, oh, yes, God is reconciling you and you and you. But then you get back home and say, I don't know if he's reconciling me unto him. Stop doing that. It's a Charlie Brown moment. And it's a very dangerous moment. That also is a ploy to elicit a response. Do you hear me? That is a tactic and a way to elicit a response, to cause a response out of somebody. Do you guys know that with each other, we have become operatives of deceit? 
in a lot of ways. When you make somebody else feel sorry for you, that's deceit, isn't it? That's causing somebody else to adopt a view of you that you want them to see you by. That is deceit. When you rule over the view of somebody else, that is deception. Do you know that? You know in the Bible when it says of the Antichrist, through peace he shall destroy many, of this person that walks on the scene, through peace he shall destroy many, he does the exact same way. He causes people to see things in his way. It doesn't mean it's going to be an evil way. It means it's his way. And we're not to do that. That is deception and its root, which contains many branches of practices we don't need in our lives. Manipulation is only one branch of that word deceit. It's only one branch. We're not here to cause people to see us in specific lights. We're here simply to represent the light of Christ and his message of reconciliation to the world. But how can we be ambassadors of the message of reconciliation when we feel so far from him? Uh-oh, there's a problem with that. We cannot carry the message of reconciliation, which is the good news or gospel. Gospel means good news, gospel of Jesus Christ. If we do not ourselves receive it in our own lives on a daily basis, when you all agree, I cannot sit there and pass a message of reconciliation to somebody else if I am not feeling reconciled. So what did the Lord Jesus do? He gave us a way to put everything in perspective. Thank you, Lord. Do you know that? Do you know that he gave us a way to put everything in a basket, a specific basket? In other words, he gave us answers to things out of the goodness of him to settle us. He did. And you know what, today we haven't studied any of that in COT, but we will. Because I know that after we study all those things collectively, you will have no questions. Do you know that? You think that's impossible, don't you? It's not. To have a question especially some of the life questions that people have today, is for the most part due to an emptiness of what the Messiah's words are. See, sometimes we reference everything else but the Messiah's words, don't we? We reference everything else but the Messiah's teachings, don't we? And we find answers all over the place, but they are not the Messiah's answers. This is a day and age we really need to know what the Messiah has given us. We need his answers, and we can have those answers. Nothing is withheld from us. Nothing. No one should be incomplete. No one. Everyone should be clear. That's when the work begins. But the work can't begin until you're clear. So, as being indoctrinated into this world, there are some things we're going to have to unlearn so that we can learn. Hmm. One more time, St. Corinthians 5.20. Now then, we are ambassadors of Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead be ye reconciled to God. Be reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us. We knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Let me read that one more time. For he hath made him to be sin for us. Who made him to be sin for us? God made Christ to be sin for us. How so? He took the sins of the world upon himself. Why? He was a sacrifice. He was the last sacrifice for those sins. So then he absorbed all those sins, even right now, by way of his blood. And he knew no sin himself, 
but took on the sins of the world. That's what a sacrifice is. A sacrifice through no fault of its own pays the price for all the strangers around it. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. Listen, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Only in him, not in ourselves. In him. Now, this is important. We are not the righteousness of God according to us, according to what we think, according to what we have read, according to the sum total of our experiences. We are not the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus because of what we know, what we don't know, what we have done, what we pursue, what we claim to know. No, it has nothing to do with flesh. We might be made the righteousness of God in Christ by Christ. By decree of the Father, which is out of love for us. Has nothing to do with what we do or do not perceive. And everything to do with the new creature. The new creature is not anything according to self. That means there are no complaints in the new creature, nor in your spirit. Zero. Only in your flesh. See, the Lord defines, the apostles define the new creature in a very fantabulous way, which is coming up. But we do have a precept now, because we just read about the flesh and the spirit. We just read about us, things according to us, and how out of place we are when things are according to us. And we read about the new creature in Christ. Did we not? We read about the new creature in Christ. Being a new creature in Christ, why? How? Because you're no longer, no longer know anybody. By way of the flesh. Right? Just like they said they knew Christ by the flesh ones, but not anymore. They don't know him by the flesh. They don't know him by the deeds he did. They don't know him by how kind he was to people. No, they don't know him like that. That's of the flesh. That's by what you perceive. That's by what you have read. They once knew him like that, and so did we, not anymore. They know him by spirit now, the absolutes, through the Holy Spirit, which is not observed by anybody in the world. The world does not have the Holy Spirit. When you know the Lord by spirit, that's through a relationship. That's not according to flesh or according to self. You see how wrong we can be about so many things because we know the word of God according to self in a lot of ways, and that's when people argue. Nobody argues by way of the new creature or the spirit. All arguments are of flesh. Did you know that? And would you be surprised to know that Jesus said that exact same thing? So did the living God. That debate begins in the flesh. It is, it is not in the spirit. Because the spirit of things are one. There is no argument. Which lets us know what? That a lot of things we do is according to flesh and not the spirit. There are things that just don't exist in the spirit. And we are to no longer walk or live our lives by way of the flesh, but of the Spirit. That's why these precepts are so important, so that we don't miss this step. So that a big empty gulf is not between us and the understanding the Lord is giving us, so that we can have absolute and total reconciliation with the Messiah. And not one of us will be lacking anything. We are not to lack anything. And we don't have to lack anything. But the caution is this. If you try to walk out your spiritual experience by the decrees and the words of the world, by the interpretation of the world or of the flesh, you'll never get there. You'll never have it, and the ending will not be according to the word of God. It will only be according to the world. So when they say, well, that's not going to happen. You know, when people come up and say, well, you can pray all day. That's not going to happen. That's a, what's that according to? 
And when you do it the world's way, suppose somebody else in the world gave you some advice and said, will not you try this? But see, that's according to flesh. That's according to their experience. My experience is not a guide to truth. Your experience is not a guide to truth. The truth is established. We may be partakers of that truth. But it is not anything that moves me on the earth. It is not anything of flesh. It is all of the Father. Do you guys see that? Remember something. The, these experiences that people have, right? These moving experiences. These dreams and moving. A lot of people have those. It does not make them truth. doesn't make them truth. It does not make them truth. Truth is of the Lord. It's of the Lord. An experience is not a guide for truth. You know what the Lord said about truth? That, it's, it, that is within the Holy Spirit. The spirit of truth is the Holy Spirit. And he said the world does not have it, nor can they have it. Because they can't see it. They can't see it, so they'll never have it. So as it turns out, the truth is what you haven't seen. Thank you, Lord. The truth is what people don't see. The truth can never be according to self, because that would be a person's truth, which may not be truth at all. Do you see that? That's just the precept we were talking about. But you get the gist of it. The natural part of us, the flesh, what's according to us to sell, is the flesh. The apostles, the apostle here said, we once knew Jesus, you know, that way by the flesh, but not anymore. We don't know him that way anymore. We don't know him that way anymore. That, that is so beautiful. That's so beautiful when he said that. That is beautiful. If we, if we can stop living our lives by these things of the world, these ideals and ideologies of this world, we'll make a step. Listen. For the love of Christ constraineth us because thus, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all. That they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them. Listen, that's a big one. That those which live should not hereafter live unto themselves, but live unto him which died for them and rose again. Wherefore, henceforth, no, we know man after the flesh. We don't know anybody after the flesh, though we have known Christ after the flesh. Yet now, here on, from hereafter, know we him no more. We don't know him anymore after the flesh, only after the spirit. And remember, after the flesh means what? According to self. To know something after the flesh is to know something according to you, according to what you see, according to what you hear, according to what you have perceived. But to know someone after the spirit is to know them by the spirit of truth, by the truth itself, that unspoken thing, the thing you can hardly communicate. If somebody were to say, when's the first time you thought of Jesus, you could not give an honest answer except to say, I always knew he was real. I always knew there was a God. But I can't give you a date, right? Can't give you that. That's one of those intangible things, one of those identifiable things, yet, yet, you have no moment for that, right? That's truth. Truth is not held within the confines of even how we, how we calculate time. Truth is far beyond that, and we can take part of that. So the apostles... They said from this point on, we don't know anybody after the flesh. We're not going to, that's a declarative statement. We're not going to know anybody after what they have done or what they have not done. 
If that person over there is lazy, we're not going to know him as lazy Bob. No. But by the Spirit. In other words, they began to see this world by truth. And they made a choice to let go of seeing things after the natural, selective ways of our flesh. They did that. That's awesome. And if you do that, you, you have that right to do that too. To, you have that right to say, okay, from this day forward, I will not know anybody in my life after the flesh. I will not. But I will know them spiritually. If you were to do that, do you not know that the Lord would compliment that? Do you know that? The Lord will always be a part of his own word. He'll always do that. Always. That's up to you. That's up to you. That's why they didn't, that's why they, that's why Jesus says, judge no one. Judge not that you be not judged. Right? That's why he said that. Because if you are identifying people after the deeds that they have committed, you're going to be known after the de after those deeds you have committed. In in this case, here we got to tackle something here. Remember this passage, Second Corinthians five ten. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. You remember that? We got to tackle that. I know it's spooky. I know it's scary. And I know that certain people didn't get this. Listen, listen. If you stand before the Son of Man, you'll stand this way. You're going to stand like this. But the Lord gave us a thousand messages. He did. He, he told us. He basically gave us instruction on how to stand before him. And we're still not doing it. We're still not doing it. He told us how. He did. He did. You know when he said, judge not that you be not judged for whatever measure you judge somebody with, you're going to be judged. Remember that? There's a matching scripture for this. The same measure that you have looked at everybody else, you will be looked at. So that means if you're in the earth and you know people, by the flesh. You can't stand before him yet. You can't do that. If you don't trust this process, you cannot stand before him yet. You can't do that. Do you know why? To, to not trust this process is to have passed judgment even upon the Lord. You can't do that. You're not ready. Those who pray that they be worthy to escape all these things and to stand before the Son of Man. If you actually pray that with sincerity, you better get ready for life-altering changes that do not come with a receipt. You better get ready to be in total, absolute conformance because who you will end up being is someone who does not see anybody after the flesh. And you'll see all people after the Spirit. Do you know what it takes to see no one? After the flesh anymore, it takes understanding. It takes going through almost hell and back. That's what it takes. Because once you're done seeing the deeds of others, that means, first of all, you have fully accepted the Lamb because you're fully acquainted with everything you have ever done. That means you have enough compassion to keep the balance in your life so that when you see somebody in error, It'll never be enough to turn you away from offering that word of reconciliation. That means God has opened your eyes and you don't have any more questions. That's what that means. See, because it is true. When you have found something, right, you don't sit there and have questions about it. Correct? Correct? If I was ready to stand before the Son of Man right now, guess what? I would be standing before the Son of Man. If you were ready to stand before the Son of Man, guess what? You would be standing before the Son of Man. He's not going to have you stand before him, and you're not ready. That's why you're still here. He's not going to have you stand before him to be condemned, because you believe in him. That would be counterproductive, which would nullify the word of God. 
That's not going to happen either. When you're ready to stand before him, you will be before him. You will. And you'll be on time. You'll never be late. You won't, which means we have things undone. And because those things are undone, I believe that by way of the Holy Spirit, many vessels in the earth, God is bringing things forward through Christ and through his word to get us on track quickly. That's what I believe. I believe the Lord is doing a quick work right now, but we have to finally say, Lord, show me. We have to be ready to receive. And I'll act like we already know it. Come on now. All of us are guilty of that to a degree. I already know that. Isn't that what we do? I, I, don't, I already know that. See, we've got to be open and teachable. And more than teachable, we have to actually put God's word, his message of reconciliation. We have to first be reconciled. Time for us to be reconciled. And stop sitting on the outside, empty, hungry, and thirsty. We're not to be quenched. We're not to quench the spirit. But we can sit right by the fountain. What's wrong with us? We'll get there. Because that's the Lord's will that we get there. And if he has to work through a, a jackass, he'll do it. That'll be me. Do you guys get that? Hmm? Of all the people who spoke, you have finally reached the mule. Is that clear? Hopefully it's clear. And yes, I said that on purpose to get your attention. Because it got your attention, didn't it? It's kind of sharp and prickly, wasn't it? Got your attention. So we can get off the people stuff, right? Back into what the Lord wants. So we can get rid of our stubbornness. And get our minds on Christ because he's taking us somewhere. And he does not waste a moment. Hmm? He does. Okay. One more break. I'm going to come back. We have another book to go into. Yes, we do. Another book to go into. I'll be right back in a few minutes right here at COT, everybody. I'm back again. And let's get started, shall we? Now, guys, I have to take time with these scriptures. It looks like I'm going to run out of time, but it is the weekend. This weekend is not like last weekend. Actually, this is a very important topic to me. Why does this require so many scriptures? Because you guys may get lost. Not that I'm saying anything that's above your heads. No. Let me give you an example of the precepts we need. We just talked about the flesh and spirit, right? Here's the biggest one. Here's what it comes down to. And this is why we're going to finish this because we have quite a few chapters to go through, right? But we may not, we won't get to it all tonight, but we have to get to it tomorrow. Here's why. Here's why. Let me give you a small example. Most of you, you know yourselves, right? Most of you know yourselves. We all know ourselves. We know what we did in life and all this and the other. Certainly know our names, but we only know ourselves according to flesh. We know ourselves According to flesh. That is not the real us. It's not the real us. We only know ourselves after the flesh. So who are you really? You ready? You want me to tell you who you really are? Anybody? Anybody care to know? It's not going to mess up your paradigm, not this one. But this is why we're going through this, so that uh, everybody gets this without question. Right. Again, when we know other people, we know them after or according to the flesh. We do. We discern all things through flesh, don't we? Don't we? We know ourselves after the flesh, don't we? We do. Who is the real you? If you're a new creature in Christ, then who are you really? You ready? Who you really are is how Christ sees you, not as you see yourself. 
You see? Do you all see that? It's kind of easy to comprehend, but we've got to cover some ground to get there. Those statements like that require scripture, a scriptural foundation. Who you really are is how Christ sees you, not how you see yourselves. Who you really are is not how I see you. It's not how your friends see you. It's not how your family sees you. It's how Christ sees you. That's who you really are. And to be candid with you, most of what we've been doing, we have been doing after the flesh. Our understanding of the word is after the flesh. It's according to self, according to what we understand and what we don't understand. It's according to our experiences. It's according to us. What is the real word? The real word is according to the living God. The real you is who Christ sees you to be. That's why there's no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. There's no condemnation. None. But we don't quite perceive it that way, do we? Because we can only see ourselves after the flesh. And it's time. It's time. It really is time for many eyes to be opened. For real. Not through an explanation. No, that the Lord open your eyes. Here's a small test. You don't have to answer this out loud but a small test. If God were to show you all the flesh of everyone you saw, what would you think of that person? Let me give you an example of that. There are people who really love each other, or did they did love each other, until one found something out on the other, and it ended the relationship, that's what happens. When, when your eyes are opened to the flesh of another, you find very distasteful things. If it's enough to cause you not to love another person, then you're by no means ready for God to open your eyes to spiritual things. If we can't handle the flesh things and it disrupts our love for somebody else, how in the world can God open our eyes to spiritual things? So here's the part of the evaluation, right? Part of the evaluation, part of the test is for you to have your eyes fully opened to flesh, full discernment, and never have it hinder your love for somebody else. I mean, truthfully, not just by language, right? Not just by language. I mean, learn the deepest, darkest secrets of somebody else and your love never be disturbed. Because your love should not be based after the flesh. Because that's not love at all, is it? If God is love, then love is in the realm of truth, which is not after the flesh at all, but bound in absolutes within our Father. There's no way knowing the flesh of another should cause you not to love them. But we know that's not true, don't we? Hmm? That's why people hate certain people in the earth. That's why they dislike strongly people in the earth based off what they see, not based off knowing the person. You guys, you guys know why I, don't, I never evaluate other folks, why I never get into conversations and talking about other people. For me to know someone after their deeds, like these television people, you only know what the TV is showing you. That's all you know and what people talk about. And if that's enough to cause you to not like a person, the word of another, or uh, we've got a ways to go, don't we? We do. 
So we have to come to a realization by scripture. We need lots of scripture. And what those scriptures will do is fend off these supporting forces of the flesh so we can be free enough, free enough in, in just a moment to consider something that the Lord can show us his truth and we can decide and go forward from there. But for the most part, the world has become an expert at showing the deeds of a person so the world can hate this person, not like that person. My like and dislike of an individual is not going to be based after the flesh. Nope, it is not. That's why I never get into these conversations of pointing fingers and all this and here. I don't do that. I don't do that. Somebody could easily do that to me. Somebody can easily do that to you. In fact, all of us have examples of that. All of you know someone who will only know the bad parts of you and tell those bad parts to somebody else to put you in a bad light. Every single last one of you knows somebody like that. Do you think that's an accident? That's not an accident. You're children of the kingdom of the living God through Christ. Surely you're to not be moved by what you can see and what you can't see on, on this earth by the natural eye. You're not to be moved by that. You are to be moved by truth only, not by hearsay. Do you all see that? We're to be operatives of God's established truth, not operatives of rumor, not operatives of what somebody has done in the earth or what they have not done. No, that's what the world is. The Lord called us for so much more. And I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful. Very hopeful. That these insights, as we look into Scripture thoroughly and deeply, it'll make a big difference. I know it will. It'll make a big, 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 big difference. Right? That way you can be effective. Now, somebody asked me, they said, well, if we can't see the flesh, if we're not to look at the flesh of a person, how do we help them? You see, let me tell you something. Can I tell you something? Let me tell you something. If we had our spiritual eyes opened, we would know all things about another individual. Nothing is withheld by way of the spirit. Nothing. When you see someone by way of the spirit, you see everything in a truthful perspective. That happens by way of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord. You see that? So that's a complete knowledge set of somebody else. In the truth, with no deceit, looking past all defenses. That's exactly what Satan does not want you to do. He can't afford to have you become that. Because he's holding many hostage. And you would be a tool by the living God to have them set free. He can't afford that. He can't afford that. He cannot afford you to see the truth of a person. You know these people up there, right, in the White House that are doing all these things? He can't afford you to understand how fearful they have become because of the oath they took. Satan has them by the rein. He has them under threats. Don't forget the scripture. When it, they narrowly look upon Satan himself and say, Is this the thing that ruled the nations? My fear, basically. Satan has them scared to death. See, Satan can't have you seeing the truth that he's holding them hostage. Because if you saw the truth, you would know what word to give them. For their ears would open and hear where they could walk away from him. He can't have you as a tool that would have them set free through Christ. He can't have that. You'd mess up everything. Now do you see what's happening? You would no longer see a person's mishaps. You would see that they're losing in a fight with Satan, is what you would see. 
The truth of it is, if a person is in sin, they're losing a battle. They're losing a battle. And Satan has them. See, the world teaches you to point at them and to push them further into hell itself, to turn your back on them, to say all manner of evil against them. That's what the world teaches. But your father teaches you to bring to them the message of reconciliation despite their current state. You see that? See why Satan works so hard to get you to just look somewhere else. That's why he infiltrates the body of Christ as best he can to hide these principles and foundational truths away from you because you're the ones that can become exactly what Jesus said you could become. You're the ones that were promised to do greater things than Christ. You are the ones who can do that. You're the children of the promise. That's who you are. He can't have you believing that. He would lose everything he worked so hard to capture. But I got news for him. See, I only know one speed, and that is to go forward in the highest gear. That's it. So, as often as we must, we'll fortify the truth here. The Lord's words. Not man's words, not my words, but the Lord's words. To point everybody back to the source of truth itself. That that message of reconciliation never end until I return. Not to have everybody ready to turn their back on everybody else. How many of you would, are willing right now to turn your back on everybody who would ever need help? How many? How many? I can't do that. I can't turn my back on anybody like that. I can't do that. Somebody said, it's hard for me to trust humans. We're not here to trust anybody. We're here to bring that message of reconciliation. See, here, here it is. I don't trust an infant. Do you guys know that? I do not trust an infant. I don't. I don't trust little kids either. And despite people saying, oh, they're such angels, no, they are not. They are little liars. I don't trust infants because they can pee in your face and punch you in the eye when you're changing them or you turn your head. I don't trust them. They can mess you up. A little infant can mess you up. I've, I've known lots of people who had a black eye from a newborn. I do. So I don't trust an infant. In fact, I live by something. You know what I live by? I'll never put my trust in any of you. Do you know why? Because I will only love you. I will not trust you. I trust the Lord. I trust him and him only. Well, I trust. But nothing will interrupt me freely loving you guys unconditionally. That means without condition. Well, there, there's, there's no prenup on this, right? So in the works of love, I can do them without hindrance. Always. I don't put my trust in humanity, in men. I don't do that. All my trust is in the most high. I already know that anybody in the flesh can fail and fail miserably. I already know that appearances can look awful bad in the flesh. See, I'm ready to see a person backstab me and continue on helping them. I'm already prepared for that. That's why I'll never put my trust in somebody else. So I can freely love them. If you put your trust in someone, you cannot freely love them anymore. They will ultimately fail you. And when they do that, you will withdraw yourself from them. Well, I'm not setting myself up for that. That's Satan's ideologies. I'm not doing that. I'm doing exactly what the Lord said do. I trust him with all that is within me, but I will love my fellow man, period. See how when we obey, Satan has no weapon against us that will prosper. When we obey. If we could just obey, hmm? if we could just obey, 
The Lord knows what he's doing. He really does. He knows exactly what he's doing. He does. Now, everybody, I'll tell you what, we got time for one small little tiny little part. We do. Galatians. We do, we we are going into Galatians. You guys ready for this? Into Galatians. Going to Galatians chapter five. All of you know this. You guys know what Galatians five is. I'm surely you know. Let's see, here we go. Stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free. And be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. This once you're free of bondage. This happens when you're free of bondage. How are you free in bondage? That's up to you to choose. How many of you are in bondage and want to be free from bondage? How many? How many? If you want to be free of bondage, by the Lord's hand. Now, you, you, I mean, there's no formula to be free of what you perceive to be bondage. There's no formula. There's you walking and responding to the Lord opening a door. Do you not know? The Lord promised that he would make a way of escape out of all sinful situations. Your bondage is not holy. A door will be opened yet again. But this time, I'm praying you take it. The door has been opened plenty of times. Out of misguided loyalties and other things, a lot of people did not take that door. They didn't. A lot of people didn't take the door because when the door opened, they said, well, where, where, where will I go? What will I do? And they had no confidence in the Lord enough to walk through that door. So we have to tackle those that when the door opens again, you can walk out. Nobody else can free you from that situation. The Lord will open the door himself, but it's up to you to walk out or not. He will always make a way of escape out of a sinful situation, that bondage you're in. He'll make a way of escape. But you have to be willing to walk through the door. The door was open, but again, many of you, when the door was opened, you had no foundation. You had no trust. Some had a blind loyalty. Went right back into bondage. We're going to make some changes. No one can make you free. Only God's word can make you free. Because only God's word is truth. And the truth will make you free. The truth will make you free. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free. And be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. Ha! Huh. Your conformance to these earthly things, Christ will profit you nothing. Hope you're listening. Hope everybody is listening. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised. And he is a debtor to do the whole law. Christ is become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. See, because Christ is for those who just can't get it right. Who don't think they're saved because somehow they have conformed to all the laws of the multitude of denominations out there. That's not going to save you. Compliance with man's kingdoms and man's ways is not going to save you. Christ is of no effect to those who think that they're going to be justified saved by them following the letter of somebody else's mandate, following all the steps given by mankind. But for those of us who have looked beyond all the steps of mankind and we see what mankind is and the spirit that dwells in mankind, for those of you who are like that, who see no escape by any ritual or any of those other things they do, Christ is of great effect. And he alone, he alone is that sacrifice 
that grants all freedom for those who would accept it upon their lives. So let's get to the heart of the scriptures. I want to read in Galatians, starting at 17. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. First establishment. The flesh. What is flesh again? There, there, oh, I skipped something. In certain scriptures, the flesh is talked about as anything according to you or anything according to me, right? The self-interpreted views. That's what flesh is. Anything we perceive according to ourselves. There are other parts of scripture that talk about flesh and how it is full of bad things, right? There is a difference between the two because the emphasis is upon principles in one case and another emphasis is upon getting away from the flesh in another case now is a good time to understand this and that's what we're doing for the flesh lusteth against the spirit what is the lust an unquenchable desire so the flesh has unquenchable desires that are contrary to the spirit the spirit is against the flesh they do not mix. Listen, and these are contrary to one another so that you cannot do the things that you would. What does that mean? You cannot do the things that you would. The things you have a natural tendency to do, that's when you stop yourself, isn't it? Huh? Things that seem logical, uh-oh, because the things that you would do are logical. Oh, no. Oh, I said that word again, didn't I? The word given by humanity to humanity, logic. The word defined by humanity. I, I just used that word, logic. People act like that word came straight from the heavens, and it did not. It didn't. It's another one of those words men use to communicate, right? Their expression of an interpretation of some event or way or path or something like that. So, he says, so that you cannot do the things that you would. The things that you, that naturally seem logical, you can't do, right? It's logical that if a person smacks you on the left cheek, that you protect yourself, right? Had it been, you, I, I bet you Heidi Begley knows she's she's into the Hebrew studies, right? Some of you who are into the Hebrew studies to actually smack somebody on the left or right cheek, which is there, right? I make no emphasis on the side yet because I'm talking about language. To do that was never a literal smack. It was never a literal smack. It's an activity that humans perform all the time, right? When somebody smacks you on the left cheek, turn him the the right also. That's, by the way, that left side is a side of offense, just so you know that. Side of offense. So when someone, basically, calls you out, uh-oh, I'll put it simply, when somebody calls you out, right, over the one thing, never fail to expose more things. How about that one? Hmm? How about that one? Yeah, that's good. In other words, logically, you don't do that. Logically, when somebody calls you out, what do you do? You defend yourselves and your, your ideals and ideologies and your ways and why you did what you did and all this, that, and the other. Logically, that's what you do. Spiritually, that is not what you do. It's not what you do. It's just like a thief. In the Bible, it says when a, if a thief were to come and to take one thing from you, you make sure that thief has everything they need. That's not logical. When a thief steals from you, logically, you would call 911, report it, something like that. But the biblical principle is different. Now, let me give you the real side of this. When a thief comes into your home and they steal something from you, right, then by way of your flesh, if you're not scared, you're going to be angry that somebody would dare walk into your house and steal from you. But at some point, especially if you're a believer, when somebody takes from you, and if you're a true believer, you're going to have a conflict inside. You are. And that conflict 
can sometimes lead you to wonder about the person that stole from you, how they're doing, what the real problem is, and can you help them in that issue. In other words, you won't continue to think about them as a low life. Actual concern comes up spiritually. That's a conflict because logically you're not to take that position, certainly in society. But by way of the spirit, something else can happen from time to time. It may not happen all the time, but it can happen from time to time. All right? And I've had somebody steal from me before or what they were, you know, if it were a long time ago, I would have halted that. And that person would have been in trouble in this case, even caught in the act. Compassion came out of me. Spiritually, compassion. As a result, that compassion ended up two years later changing that person's life. That small act where everybody else had responded in this standard way. I didn't. And it's not like I tried it, right? It was. It just so happened at that at that point, I was very concerned about the person. I could see something possibly nobody else saw. Possible. I took a spiritual position, a stance in that in that circumstance. Do you know the person got away with the stolen item? They did. Because I, I let them walk away with it. I did. But it, it did something to them two years later. That person made it a point to get in contact with me. There's a beautiful ending to it, but that sometimes happens. Should you do that on your own? I didn't do that on my own. I did that spiritually, and that's the difference. I didn't just decide, well, I'm going to do this spiritually and do it. Nope, that's not what happened. I yielded to the Spirit. And there was much direction in me. The initiation of the whole thing came because I didn't see them as a thief. I saw them as a human being in trouble. That's where it came from. I saw them as a human being, and they were losing a battle, and they were in trouble. And at that point, I'll be honest, I didn't care what they were taking. I did not care. Because at that moment, nothing had value over that thief. Nothing had value over the thief. How ironic. That's not logical, but that was spiritual. And it did a work I couldn't have expected. I couldn't. And to that person, that was surely a, 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 a holy work in that person's life. It really was. His perception of what happened is, is likely with him to this very day. It was one of those life-changing moments. What did I feel? You know, when it happened, when it happened, the Spirit intervened. I just yielded to the Spirit and his value as God's creation went above all merchandise on the planet in that moment. Isn't that something? 17, so 18, 18. But if you be led of the Spirit, you're not under the law. You're not under the law. If you're led of the Spirit, you're not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, adultery, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, uh, seditions, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Of which I tell you before, as I have also told you in times past, that they which do such things, shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Uh-oh. If there's no inheritance of the kingdom of God, a person will not step foot in the kingdom. So those who do such things, it says, those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, Against such there is no law. Notice how you didn't see righteous anger in there. Because righteous anger is a compensation of people's anger. That's a term people came up with. Trying to liken themselves to Christ. I heard one person say, well, Christ got angry, so I can too. Hey, you're not Christ. And we can interpret that. 
based off some reading and think that we know everything. We're going to stop doing that. My, my. In this moment of that thief that was coming in to take the merchandise from me, the fruits of the Spirit prevailed, and the flesh was quickly put down. Where it says joy, peace, and long-suffering is a fruit of the Spirit. That's your patience. Long-suffering is patience, a fruit of the Spirit. So your spirit is willing to wait and has no rush on anything, but your flesh is not willing to wait. Your flesh is the impatience that you have. But your spirit is full of patience. Huh? Somebody said, be angry and sin not. That's right. And that term in the Hebrew does not say go ahead and get angry. It's not what it says. It means to be angry and sin not. The verb is just different. It means when that happens, quickly douse it. I think one of the literal translations from Hebrew to English is kind of fuzzy, though, is to, is to immediately douse it. Right? In other words, your flesh can get angry. It's going to feel all sorts of things, right? Quickly douse it. You have power over it. Do not allow your flesh to cause you to act in what it has responded to. Remember, your flesh has characteristics that are opposite of the spirit. So your flesh can get angry, but you're not to let the anger fester nor operate in the anger. You are to quickly douse it, which means you overcome your flesh in that manner quickly. Do you see how some spirit is in, in the body of Christ trying to cause people to remember Scripture but to live their lives based on things of flesh? That's an infiltrator, a dark spirit, a very dark spirit. See how that works? That means all of us get angry. All of us do, because your body's going to have these responses, right? Somebody asked me, Mike, how do you operate in that discomfort? Because my eyeball, right, is red and scratchy and itchy and all that stuff. How do you operate like that? I said, that has nothing to do with anything spiritual of me. And the moment you begin to operate like that, your flesh has no dominion over you. You know what that means? Your pain signals are diverted. Huh, isn't that something? Somebody wanted the answer to that one day. I just gave it. Just gave it. I have dominion over the body. The body does not have dominion over me. Just make sure you define yourself as who you really are. Who Christ sees you to be, he also described, didn't he? Hmm? He did. He described you. Christ did. But are you still seeing yourself based on the mirror and based on what you think you did in life or what you think you did not do? Or are you finally accepting who Christ has described you to be? Because if you become that person, then walk in your dominion over the flesh and stop giving in to the flesh. Override it. When my flesh gets hungry, I do not feed it. It eats when I choose for it to eat. See how that works? Hmm? When it gets sleepy, I do not sleep when it desires sleep. I sleep when I decide it will sleep. I never give in to the flesh, not an ounce, not in anything, certainly not in any desire. Because if you give in in one area of desire, it will want more and more and more and more. And it will cry like a stubborn baby. It will. It will pester you like a fly. If you give it an inch, it takes a mile your own flesh. But once you take dominion over it and you decide what happens and when, that's a different story. It will obey, just like a puppy dog, right? Do you guys know that if you do not take command of your house with a puppy in it, you're going to stress the puppy out. It has to be the alpha. And it's not, it can't be an alpha among humans. But when you take charge over your house, and and you're 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 limiting the actions of that puppy. The puppy can then relax. When you allow a dog to bark at the front door like he's a lunatic, 
You stress the dog out because it will believe it has to do that, right? But as soon as you get up and tell the dog to go sit down, in about, what, four or five days, that dog, his stress levels go down to nothing. When you're in charge, the spiritual you, the you as defined by Christ when you're in charge, everything changes. If you allow your flesh to be in charge, everything is out of control. And those of you who love dogs, if you let your dog, if that dog is in control of your house, you have chaos. Lots of moments of chaos. Your flesh is just like that relationship. It's just like that. It's time for you to take the reins of your life spiritually until your flesh know. So what if the stomach is growling? So what if you, you're thirsty by way of the mouth? You do what you do according to truth and of your father for a reason, have a reason behind it. To be a glutton is to do what? To eat with no reason, with no purpose involved, just to eat. To not be a glutton is to purpose what you eat and when you eat. To pray over your foods, the same thing. See that? The more we practice these ways, the more natural they become, the more natural the spiritual ways become. Until one day, you're doing many things spiritually and you do not live the same life anymore. And all those old problems are gone. And you don't have that repetitive cycle. Somebody knows what I'm talking about, about that repetitive cycle. The th I thought I was free moments. You, you, when you get tired of having those, right? You get tired of having those, you're going to try something else. I call that the yo-yo syndrome. That's when you go through the same things in life over and over again. That's when people start saying, why is this always happening to me? Because you keep doing the same thing. Because you keep justifying the flesh. Because you keep building a bridge between the flesh and the spirit. And the flesh and the spirit are contrary to one another. Galatians 5, 17, for the flesh lusteth against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary one to another. So that you cannot do the things that you would. Once your destination changes, you have no words for your own breakthrough. You can't describe it. You're not going to take control of it, be the expert of it, and tell somebody else. That's not going to happen either. You're going to sit there dumbfounded. First, I'm going I'm to be honest. Anybody who's, who's had a breakthrough and look back on their breakthrough, they feel foolish. They'll say, oh, my goodness, I was so dumb and stubborn that I kept myself in that circumstance all those years, and all I had to do, all I had to do was let go. Let go of my own stubbornness, my own will to have my way, right? That's what we find out, that the Lord has always been there to grant us a goodness, but we're the ones refusing it. We still want our way, no matter what the Lord has, has put in our direction. We still want our way. We want to control our own blessings. We want to name our own blessings. Look at the nature of prayer. How many people pray and they say, Lord, I want you to, uh, Lord, would you just, you just give me the money so I can do this, that, and the other. Now, how many people pray, Lord, can you take care of this financial situation? I don't need to see the anything. Please help me to understand it. So it can be taken care of. That's not how people pray. They say, Lord, I need $492, Lord, to take care of this problem. Or $492.56. Because they said be specific. So I'm being specific. But what we're doing is we're praying to the living God that he give us a certain screwdriver so we can fix our own problem. That's what we're doing. We're trying to get tools from God so we can fix our own problem. But how dumb is that? Right? I'd be like somebody saying, Lord, give me, I need a wrench so I can fix a transmission on a car. Well, you keep praying like that. You know what I'm going to say. 
Lord, renew that car. Thank you, Lord. You know what, you know what else? I'll, I'll go further than that. I'll just say, Lord, thy will be done. And so I walked outside, right? Somebody says, you know, Mike, I, I thought you needed this new car, so I went and got it for you. Here you go. Here are the keys. I'll see you later. Oh, appreciate it, right? When you think you have the answer, go ahead and be specific because you know how to solve your own stuff. That works well for it, right? That doesn't work at all. But when you trust the will of God, why not just say that? That's why I'm telling you guys, I don't pray for myself. I don't have to. I don't have to do that. All my prayer is concentrated to everybody else. It, it really is. It really is. I don't have to pray for myself. I don't. God has already promised healing many thousands of years ago. I don't need to pray for that. It's already there. I just need to receive it and walk in it. Right? I'm always mindful of everything that happens like the, like the, I, let me tell you guys something. When I scratch a, a few days ago, right, I'm sitting there, you know, doing some metal work and something went up in my eyeball and it hurt. So they, the little metal pieces out, right, scratchy eyeball and everything else. But I'm so thankful that happened. Does that seem weird? Thankful for the discomfort, the scratchiness, everything. Do you know why? I've been hurt and injured lots of times in my life. So let me share this with you. The moment we stop crying about the injuries and the health problems, all this, that, and the other, is the moment we begin to understand why they happened in the first place. Then we understand that God was truly behind it. He was, right? Now, how bad would it be? Because I, I, I thought about it. I said, Lord, thank you, because I took a chance. I took a chance, and it just so happened when I took a chance, it, it bit me. It stung me, right? I took a chance. I took a chance, and it got me. You know how you're rushing, and you're doing something? You don't need anything else. You're taking a chance. Here's what you don't realize. If you take a chance, and you put yourself a commission, somebody else, their blessing is cut off. If you're truly an instrument of God's usage in the earth, then you're not just nobody. And your presence here on this earth means everything. It means everything to somebody else. If you're a parent, your children have to have you. That's why you're the parent. It doesn't matter if they, if you think they like you or not, that doesn't matter. It matters that you're the parent. That's what matters. But if you take yourself out of the picture, if they don't have you, who do they have? God put you there because they had no one else. Hmm? God made you the parent of that child. That's why he sent you in the first place. For those people, he will put in your life. You hear me? So you don't take chances with what God blesses you with called this day. You don't throw caution to the wind. Listen, and the most important lesson is this. If you neglect any area of your life, God has given you power not to neglect and to truly understand. The moment you neglect it is the moment darkness will strike. If you're tired of darkness striking, then stop leaving things undone. Don't become lazy, slothful. Don't do that. Be vigilant. It is required of us. God does require stewardship of what he gives us. When we become lazy, things happen. You, all of you, know this in your personal lives. If you're above a certain age, you know this. When you start looking over things, the very areas you looked over, something happens. Something happens you don't want to happen. Something happens to slow you down. And most things that happen in our lives like that is because we had become lazy, because we failed to look through something thoroughly, because we skimmed over something when God has given us an ability to see it all, because we took shortcuts. And why would all that type of behavior be important? Because your children of an everlasting kingdom, joint heirs with Christ, royalty in the making. You have great promises over you right now. You're going to rule and reign with Christ. What kind of rulers, co-rulers are we going to be? And we know, we don't even know where you're about to be born and greater responsibility could be in eternity. 
much greater responsibility. But all that begins right now. All of it. All of it. God requires stewardship. Sober people who are alert, caretakers who miss nothing. No dereliction of duty. No shucking responsibilities. No leaving something off today and saying we're going to get it tomorrow. But doing everything we can in the day we're blessed to occupy. To do it to the best of our abilities. That's when the Lord responds with his kindness. And his word reacts in our lives. He's already blessed the one. He's already blessed the one that is thorough in this day. Do you know that? He's already blessed us. So that if you're thorough, the blessing is yours. But if we miss something, uh-oh, the penalty is ours. And I got the penalty. And I'm thankful. I'm thankful, right? You know how when you're, when you're working with tools, sometimes you can neglect how powerful the tool is until you get burnt or cut something very deep. And then all of a sudden you realize, wait a minute. This tool can really mess people up. Let me have res let me respect it. In other words, let me not take chances with it. Right? Let me not take chances with it. And what ends up happening is when you don't take chances with a tool, actually two things happen. You don't get hurt, number one. But your work ethic is increased. Because when you uh, are not overlooking the details of one thing, that translates to the rest of your life. So if you increase in one area by way of stewardship, all areas of your life benefit. Isn't that something? It also means that if one area of your life is lacking, all areas can suffer. That's what it means. And we already know ourselves, right? We know ourselves. All of us have had alarms. When we were enthusiastic about going to a destination or something we had to do the alarm rung once sometimes it didn't get a chance to ring we're already up responding to it right when we're not enthused we always need 10 more minutes five more minutes is that is that fair to say we always need that right so when we're not enthused you know what often motivates us when something goes horribly wrong, then all of a sudden, we don't need the five more minutes. We need to get up and get alert and find out what happened. And then we start paying attention to everything. One thing goes wrong, we start looking at everything, right? God knows how to wake us up. He does. You live in a very different time now. You do. No doubt people are going to count on you for something. And right now, it's almost like a spirit of laziness is upon many, and we know it. So the Lord has to wake us up. So things that happen that seem unfortunate by way of, you know, the flesh, seeing it by way of flesh or according to flesh, right, or self-interpretation, it may seem bad, but it's good. This injury may seem bad, but it's actually a blessing. Because it caused me to kind of not throw caution to the wind on everything. On everything. That's translating. And seeing things I missed. I actually missed things. Now I'm not missing them. I'm getting everything. Over time. Right? Over time. Because if I miss things, like the website, if I miss certain things in the website, the website's compromised. It comes down. It doesn't work. The chat rooms won't work. Not just COT chat rooms, right? But the other ministries who are utilizing COT tech, their chat rooms won't work either. If I start to overlook things, I don't need to have a lazy attitude. I need to be vigilant to stay up with the standard because criminals are always trying to hack. I got to stay four steps ahead of them. Because what would happen to the churches that are utilizing our services if I fall asleep at the wheel? What do you think would happen? They would suffer. Their communications would suffer, would throw them off their schedules, things of that nature. No, they're not paying for it, but they're going to have the best possible product out there. They are the most secure, 
the most robust. That's why that little thing with the eyeball was a blessing. Because it caused me to pay attention to details. I, I was missing some things. I'm telling you now, I was missing some things. And that reactivated something within me. So it was awesome. It was a blessing. It's a true blessing. And that goes to tell you that often things are perceived by way of flesh one way. But in fact, spiritually, there's something else. There's something else. God is not making mistakes, and nothing happens on accident. There are no accidents. Everything is purposed. Why? Because you believe in Christ. Because you depend upon him ultimately. We can be stubborn sometimes, foolish, and mean to each other, but we are dependent upon him. We know there's no future without him. We already know that. And he knows that too, and he's helping us. He knows we're infants. Hmm. Remember that. Okay, folks, I've kept you past your time, but don't worry. We have to finish this. We have, uh, let's see, one, two, three, four, and five. Five more chapters to cover tomorrow out of five more books. Are you guys okay with that? We're going to do that tomorrow. I'll post the time on the website. i got to clear the schedule. Uh, listen, as far as a broadcast of concern, they're going to be the same titles, but different uh, descriptions in each one. Okay. Now, some of them may stay the same this week because a hurricane upset some things this week. So we're going to tackle. We have foundational subjects in quite a few things um, that you have to know about. Otherwise, I may sound like a lunatic to you in the near future coming out with certain subjects. I know it's... Uh, I know some of the statements are outstanding. Listen, but I'm not following man's standards with some of these conversations. I'm not doing that. You know how a lot of people say, well, you know, if you have an extraordinary fact, you've got to have some extraordinary evidence. Yeah, well, that's for them. That's not the purpose of this. The purpose of this is to get people acquainted to what they're going to go through anyway, right? Now, listen, that means you may not believe it at first. But if you hear it, and it's likened under certain things, but I'll, throw, I'll, I'll just let you know this is out there. But this is, you know, this according to this is how it is, right? Now, all you have to do is hear it. You're not here to believe it. You don't have to believe it, right? But you can hear it. That way, when you're exposed to it, that unbelievable situation, you'll already be armed for it. I want you to be armed for things you'll certainly encounter. That's my hope, because I know that there's even a piece of me, and I know that people, are, are, they're, they're underestimating even disclosure itself. They think they have their finger on what's going to be disclosed, and I'm telling you right now, shock and awe is coming. It's coming, and it's not going to favor anybody. People are going to be swept up by utopia. They're going to instantly embrace something they never, ever saw before. And that's very sad, don't you think? But not before people are attacked by things that were never supposed to exist. There are biblical principles behind all these things. It's time to check our foundations in Christ so that if we are confronted, we will not be moved. Because if we can be moved by other human beings, we don't stand a chance before anything else. One of the keys is never to be moved, not to, to no longer be moved by any situations you're having in your life, not your health, not issues, not anything. That will happen, and you will not be moved by anything. Humanity can dish your way. Then you'll be prepared to withstand other things. We have a short time to get all that established. Very short time. In fact, we have just enough time. Just enough time. Folks, listen, I'm going to run. I'm not going to hold you hostage a second longer. God bless each and every one of you. You guys enjoy the weekend. The, the Lord is with you guys. He knows us. He knows us. He's raising us. Remember that. The Lord knows exactly what he's doing in raising us. You're here for a purpose. He didn't make a mistake. He didn't. He's going to bring you all the way home. 
is establishing in you only what he can establish. And it is beautiful in the end. God bless and keep you. I'll see you guys next time right here at COT. God bless.